thank you so much for joining us today um, for our congressional briefing, Women's Health Research, Understanding the Roles of Sex and Gender. So I'm Katie Schubert. I'm president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research. SWHR is the thought leader in promoting research on biological sex differences in disease and improving women's health through science policy and education. Our co-hosts, the Endocrine Society, represent a global community of physicians and scientists dedicated to accelerating scientific breakthroughs and improving patient health and well-being. We're really happy to have you all here with us today. Um, and we're very pleased to have several distinguished panelists joining us for today's briefing. We have Dr. Margaret McCarthy, Professor and Chair of the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Maryland. Dr. Janine Austin Clayton, Director of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. Dr. Jill Becker, the Biopsychology Area Chair Professor of Psychology and Senior Research Professor at the Michigan Neuroscience Institute at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Becker was actually also recently appointed as Editor-in-Chief of the Biology of Sex Differences Journal. And Mila Becker, Chief Policy Officer at the Endocrine Society. Following the speaker presentations, I'll be moderating a discussion with all of our panelists and we invite you all to use the Q&A box um, to submit these questions throughout our briefing. We'll be monitoring it and coming to that at the end of um, the, the panelists' talks. And we'll also be live tweeting today. So if you are also live tweeting along with us, please use the hashtag Women's Health Research. Both sex and gender influence our health across the lifespan. The terms sex and gender are not interchangeable as they encompass different aspects of health. Sex refers to biological classification of living things according to reproductive organs and chromosomes, while gender refers to the self-perception of one's identity and the social, cultural, and environmental influences that can affect an individual's health. Understanding how sex and gender impact health and disease would benefit all people, yet up until about 25 years ago, most health research was conducted only on men. This exclusion of females extended to biomedical research on female animals, cells, and tissue. Researchers assumed that they could simply extrapolate their male-only study results to females, which is a dangerous precedent that overlooked the impact of sex and gender on health. Fortunately, Congress passed the National Institutes of Health Revitalization Act in 1993, which mandated the inclusion of women and minorities in NIH-funded clinical trials. And then five years ago, the NIH implemented a policy requiring grant applicants to consider sex as a biological variable in research designs, analyses, and reporting in vertebrate animals and human studies. So if grant applicants seek to only study one sex, then they must offer strong justification for that. Despite this policy, there are some issues around the inclusion of sex as a biological variable in research that persist. And although more researchers are including both sexes in their studies, most are still not conducting sex-based analyses, preventing researchers from truly understanding the impact of biological sex um, and how, what it has on health outcomes. And I think um, as we see in many cases today, the COVID-19 pandemic has provided a clear example of why we really need a better research um, regarding the influence of sex and gender on our health. Um, ongoing data collection suggests that there are stark sex and gender disparities when it comes to COVID-19. Men are more likely than women to have severe symptoms, to require hospitalization, and to die from the virus, while women seem more likely to suffer longer-term side effects. And to explore all of these issues further, we'll kick off the conversation with Dr. Margaret McCarthy, who will discuss sex as a biological variable broadly, what it means, why it matters, and how it influences overall health. Dr. McCarthy. Hey, thank you very much, Kate. So I'm really pleased to be here today uh, to talk to you about one of my favorite topics. First, by way of background, I'm a basic scientist. I'm a neuroscientist who I study the interplay between the endocrine system, the immune system, and the nervous system with an emphasis on the developing brain. So I'm really pleased to talk about sex as a biological variable because I think it is the most important and cross-cutting issue in biomedical research today, not just because it's been long neglected, but because it really touches on every corner, um, every pocket of, of research that we do as uh, biomedical researchers. So how are sex differences determined? Um, it's multifactorial, it starts with our genes, whether or not you have an XX or an XY sex chromosome complement. 
as of course influenced by your experience, particularly in humans, because that experience starts from the very second that you're born. Uh, we live in a highly gendered world and you're going to be treated differently based on whether or not you're a baby boy or a baby girl, just even down to the uh, way in which your mother or even strangers talk to you and interact with you. And that's all gonna impact uh, your developing brain as well as your body. And then lastly, we're influenced very strongly by our hormones. We all know testosterone is a quintessential male hormone, estrogens and progesterones is quintessential female hormones. But in fact, all of these hormones are found in both men and women um, and can play very different as well as very similar roles in each sex. So sex also exerts profound influences on both health and disease. And here are just sort of two general examples from neuroscience as well as immunology. Uh, the panel on the left, that's the pie chart, um, shows sort of the relative gender bias in various neuropsychiatric and neurological disorders. On the right hand side, you see disorders that are male biased in their frequency. And the size of the wedge of the pizza pie in this pie chart is a, a measure of how strong that gender bias is. So boys are more likely to be diagnosed with uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity orders about 10 times uh, more often than girls. Autism is four to five times more frequently diagnosed in boys. Dyslexia, stuttering, Tourette's, all two to three times more frequently diagnosed in boys. And early onset schizophrenia, this is a very young adult male, more likely to be diagnosed. All of those have a developmental onset, as opposed to the left side of the pie chart where we see female bias disorders. And again, the size is a measure of the gender bias with late onset schizophrenia up into the 40s. Uh, anorexia is about uh, combined with bulimia 14 times more prevalent in women than in men. Uh, autoimmune, multiple sclerosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, obsession, compulsion, all of the uh, emotive disorders are off two to one more frequent in women. And these are in general what we consider adult onset disorders. So there's clearly some profound biological underpinning to this uh, a shift across the lifespan and the relative risk of these various disorders. On the right hand side, you just see uh, a whole slew of autoimmune disorders and their relative incidence by sex, uh, with the first one, Slogin syndrome, being an almost exclusively female disorder. But you can see almost all of these are much more prevalent in women until we get to uh, diabetes, type 1 diabetes, which is just slightly higher in men and is a, seems to be quite a unique type of uh, autoimmune disorder. So how do we separate this biological influence of sex from the cultural and environmental effects that are due to gender, which in humans are just really literally impossible to separate out. And they also have profound health consequences. And so uh, you know, we shouldn't ignore them in humans, but if we want to be able to distill out just what is biological, we have to turn to our animal models which we, we do in all of biomedicine in order to you know, avoid the facts that we can't do the kind of experiments we would like to in humans uh, and also to just reduce the number of variables. Um, but we, we've had a problem in the use of our animal models across all of biomedical uh, research, which was Katie mentioned at the beginnings, which was that there has not been equal representation. Uh, we need an equal rights act for our, our mice and rats. Um, this is just a compilation of publications over a hundred year span. Um, that went, started back in uh, the 1900s. And you can see back in the uh, early uh, uh, 1900s, nobody even bothered to mention what the sex was of the animals that they were conducting research on. These are, are journal publications that were, were surveyed by uh, some investigators. Uh, in about the, the 60s to 70s, people started to pay attention to the sex of their animals. But what you can see what happened is, is that they overwhelmingly moved to male animals. This is in, uh, this is our neuroscience related research. Actually, the opposite happened in immunology, where they overwhelmingly moved to just female animals. So it's not always just males, it's, it depends on the discipline. So in addition to it kind of going exclusively to only one sex in the animal studies, nobody bothered to even if they did have both sexes to actually parse out whether or not that sex was having any influence. So these are the percent of articles that were analyzed for sex. Um, and in the field of immunology, you can see only about four to 5% of the studies actually took into account uh, the sex of the individual, given what we're no, now we're going to hear more about COVID and the immune response to COVID. Um, this is really leaving out a huge portion of the population, as I said, overwhelmingly female in these studies. Neurosciences, on the other hand, only about 20% bothered to take into account uh, the influence of sex. So 80% of studies were either done exclusively on males or did not ever consider that there was any difference. Uh, fields of physiology and pharmacology also 
pretty equally sinful. And when you think about that, these are the disciplines that are the undergirding of our pharmaceutical industry, and they are developing the drugs um, that we are giving to people. Um, this is this is a problem, and hence why uh, Congress has acted. So sex differences, um, it might seem simple, just like, you know, let's just know what's different in, in men versus women, but it's actually really quite complex. For one thing, um, it varies across the lifespan, the influence of, of your sex in very different ways. Sex differences are established exceedingly early, actually beginning in utero. So, you know, it's kind of all over before you're born. Um, many people think that males make testosterone only at puberty, but actually the fetal uh, testis of, of the male is capable of copious testosterone production, in fact, producing a large surge of testosterone while the fetus is still in utero. This is not only just to differentiate the secondary sex characteristics, uh, but also to act on the brain, if not the rest of the body. Females do not have this hormonal exposure. This early hormonal exposure is called programming or organizing because it's gonna set up the response to later events in life and later responses to androgens. The other thing that it does is if you are comparing the health of a fetus of a male versus a female, when it comes to the endocrine system, you're actually comparing an apple to an orange, right? It's not just a male to a female, it's a completely different endocrine environment. That's also true if you're making a comparison at puberty. Females have puberty years earlier on average than uh, boys do. If you go to midlife, men have rather consistently high androgens, pretty steady, it doesn't vary that much, whereas females will go through uh, menstrual cyclicity, pregnancy, lactation, really substantial uh, hormonal changes. And then lastly, at the end of life, men's testosterone might be lower, but it's not in the basement. It's still very much there, whereas women um, can be in an endocrine status that's completely deprived of, of gonadal steroids. So not all sex differences are created equal. That's the other thing people just sort of say, well, it's just a sex difference or like they like to call everything a sex dimorphism, but there are sex dimorphisms, which are different from sex differences, which are different from population frequency difference, different from latent sex differences and different from context dependent. So what are all these different examples? Well, sex dimorphism is a very overused term. They're actually rather rare uh, in biology. So sex dimorphism means die to morph forms, two forms. So it's when something comes in completely different forms in males versus females. This is true of much of the reproductive system, but it also occurs outside of the reproductive system on very specific examples. So for example, symptoms of a heart attack, uh, uh, women have ex a completely different set of symptoms. Some are common, um, but some are completely different, which is why women often mistake things like indigestion uh, for, they mistake a heart attack for indigestion, uh, which can have devastating consequences. Hormone dependent cancers, breast cancer and prostate cancer are both cancers, but they're in very different uh, forms in men versus women and with different uh, uh, biological origins. Much, much more common is what we call just a basic sex difference. And it's really important to keep that difference in mind because it means something completely different, which is that we have an endpoint that varies along a continuum from lesser to greater, but it's the same endpoint, be it a morphological trait, um, be it, uh, you know, for example, height is a common one, but it could also be a physiological response and things. Um, and it's going to be the same response in men and women, but the average difference is different between males versus females. Yet a huge percentage of the population is going to overlap. So in fact, you could never predict the sex of an individual based on this measure uh, because it is along the continuum. There's always individuals that are going to cross into the other category. Examples are bone density. Men tend to have a uh, higher bone density on average than women or say cholesterol, uh, which tends to be higher on average in women. Population frequency is another different type of sex difference. It's the same endpoint, uh, it's the same disease or disorder, but it's just more common in one sex versus the other. I gave you quite a few examples of that in the beginning in both the immunology field and the neuroscience field. Uh, others are Alzheimer's, much more frequent in women and not just because they live longer and we're trying to understand why it's more frequent in women versus Parkinson's disease, which is just slightly more frequent in men. And here we don't know if it is the biology of, of men versus women, or if it's that men are working in environments where they're li more likely to be exposed to environmental toxins, uh, which is why, again, it's very important that we tease out the biological from the cultural origins. Then there are latent sex differences, and these are not only the most tricky, they're probably in some ways the most important. 
they're tricky because we don't know that they're there until we go looking for them. So what do I mean by a latent sex difference? It means we have an endpoint that is the same in uh, men versus women. So let's say um, neurological pain is the same. Both men and women are experiencing the pain in the same way. But the cellular mechanisms that are determining that pain, that are causing the pain neurons to fire, is completely different. And this has actually been uh, demonstrated to be the case. That means that the, the drugs, the medicines that you're going to use to treat the pain are not going to work the same in men versus women. So we have to understand the, the molecular uh, biological underpinnings of this uh, response. So for example, as I said, regulating pain, also immune, uh, immune responses to infection, just the immune response to a vaccine is completely different uh, in men versus women. Again, these are the trickiest because you don't know they're there until you go looking for them. So if you say something is the same in men and women, uh, maybe not, you have to look beneath the hood. And then lastly, we have context dependent sex differences. And these are when like under normal, healthy, uh, sunny day kind of conditions, men and women are exactly the same, boys and girls, males and females are exactly the same until there's a storm cloud, right? There's some sort of stress. It might be a physiological stress. It might be a psychological stress. It might be an injury, an insult, an illness. And then that will reveal a sex difference. Sometimes it'll be only one sex responds to the insult. Sometimes it'll be the two sexes will respond in opposite directions. Uh, so one of the things that we know from the animal literature is that if you create stress around a learning paradigm, it can improve male learning and actually impair female learning. And then they took this on to undergraduates and found out, guess what? It's actually the same for them as well. Um, things like responses <clears throat> to drugs of abuse are quite different in males versus females, which is are the underlying reasons for why um, females can actually uh, move towards uh, dependency and addiction faster than males. So lastly, why, you know, those are all good reasons also for uh, studying sex differences because it's really important to, to health, uh, but it also has a, additional uh, powers that are sometimes not appreciated, which is that we can discover fundamental biological pr principles not otherwise evident. So when you go to the doctor, if you're having heart pain, he's gonna inject you with a contrast agent, right? A dye so that he can see your heart vessels because he can't see them otherwise. Well, when you compare males and females, sometimes we see things we never would have seen otherwise because we had no contrast by which to visualize it. We can avoid deleterious effects of therapies based on research on just one sex. This has already happened, and so we have to uh, make sure that we learn our lesson and don't let this happen again. We can expand the impact of our research fundings to a much broader population, hopefully the entire population, and thereby enhance the health of both sexes. So if we find out that females are resilient or protected from a particular disorder, let's find out what the cellular basis of that is, develop a therapeutic, and see if it can be applied to males and uh, prevent them from suffering from the disorder and vice versa. And that is the end of my, my slides, so I will stop there. Thanks so much, Dr. McCarthy. I, I really love sort of this framing of not all sex differences are created equal. So um, let's put a pin in that and remind folks that they can use the Q&A box for questions. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Janine Clayton as director of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. Dr. Clayton will share the agency perspective on sex and gender, including more information on NIH's groundbreaking 2016 policy on sex as a biological variable, um, their ongoing efforts related to sex and gender, and how the NIH hopes to build on their current work. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Clayton. Thank you, Dr. Schubert. Delighted to be here and excited to share with you some information about the NIH Sex as a Biological Variable or SABV policy. Just first want to start so to make sure we're all on the same page regarding the NIH mission and the ORWH mission. So our mission at ORWH is to enhance and expand women's health research, make sure that women and underrepresented groups are included in NIH-supported clinical research, and promote career advancement for women in biomedical careers. And in our last trans-NIH strategic plan for women's health research called Advancing Science for the Health of Women, NIH articulated for the very first time our vision for the health of women. We imagine a world where sex and gender are integrated across the entire biomedical research continuum, where every woman receives evidence-based prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and care, and all women in science reach their full potential. So SABV, from our perspective, is just good science. We know that the future advances that we're going to need in society depend on the rigor and reproducibility of the science we're doing now. And considering sex as a biological variable is a critical component 
of a robust and rigorous scientific and evidence base. In other words, good science. So what is the NIH policy on sex as a biological variable, SABV? Basically, in a nutshell, we stated in 2016, or went into effect in 2016, expectations that sex as a biological variable would be factored into the research designs, analyses, and reporting three areas for vertebrate, animal, and human studies. And so what do the data show about how SABV has been integrated? Uh, Nicole Voinovich and Teresa Woodruff published a this paper, and they looked at study section members and what they said about their experience at peer review when applications were being reviewed and how well sex as a biological variable was considered. So the bottom line is 66% of those surveyed said that the majority of applicants adequately addressed SABV in designs, analysis, and reporting. And if you drill down a little bit further, you can see here that that Basically, uh, in terms of being confident that they understood the policy, app reviewers were definitely confident, 88%. 68% um, said that it was important that NIH-funded studies consider sex as a biological variable in research design. And then 58% think SABV will improve rigor and reproducibility. If you break that down by the gender of the reviewer, you can see that in both cases, more women than men had those attitudes. So what about publications? You heard from Dr. McCarthy some of the critical information beginning at the 1900s. In 2020, there was a follow-up study done that looked across nine different biological disciplines in papers published, published in 34 different journals in 2019, and they compared the data to 10 years before. What they showed was an increase in the percentage of sex-inclusive articles, meaning both males and females were included, with significant increases in neurology, immunology, endocrinology, and physiology, and an increase in the number of studies that provided evidence-based rationale for it being a single-sex study, all males or all females, which is part of the SABV policy. If you drill down into the data, what you can see here is that uh, the purple is both sexes and the blue and red are single-sex studies, and you can see several of these disciplines showed increase in the proportion of studies in these publications that were sex inclusive, both males and females. But if you look a little bit deeper, you can see that we do have more work to do here. Uh, the per percentage of articles that actually perform sex-based analyses when they had both males and females actually went down, except for in one field, pharmacology. And so there is a lot of work to be done. It's not just enough to include males and females. We need that analysis to be done as appropriate for that study design. So why is that important? And, and what is the potential impact? NIH is the largest biomedical research funding enterprise in the world and implementation of this policy has far reaching impact. We peer review over 80,000 applications every year and tens of thousands of investigators are writing applications. They're conducting research in vertebrate animals and humans, and they are now considering how sex could influence their research as a result of this policy. And last year, we summarized some of our key advances. And so from an ORWH perspective, we have a variety of research programs that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the institutes and centers, there are 27 institutes and centers at NIH, and they've undertaken a variety of steps to address SABV. They've had workshops, they've developed funding opportunity announcements specific for sex differences in their mission areas, and they've incorporated sex as a biological variable into fundamental studies like the Common Fund and the Genotype Tissue Expression Project, or GTEx, which you'll hear more about from Dr. Becker. Further integration, though, of SABV depends on all of us doing our part across the biomedical research enterprise, from journal editors to publishers to funders to regulatory bodies, academicians, IRBs, IACOCs, and even our patients. So what do we do from an ORWH perspective? We put science to work for the health of women and we want every single institute at NIH to do their part. So we collaborate with 27 institutes and centers and these are our signature research programs. Our BIRCH program is a career development program designed to increase the cadre of women's health researchers. And we have supported over 700 BIRCH scholars in the last 20 years. 
Our SCORE program is a specialized centers of research excellence on sex differences. We collaborate with eight institutes and centers on our SCORE program. It's NIH's only disease agnostic sex center level grant program focused on sex differences. An administrative supplement program where we provide additional funding to investigators who are either using just one sex, male or female, and wanna add the opposite sex or wanna add numbers of research subjects for both sexes to increase their power. Um, so those are our sex and gender administrative supplements. And then we have a special administrative supplement program focused on understudied, underreported, and underrepresented populations of women that we call the U3 program. And I'm excited to share with you our newest program is our R01. Um, that's NIH's bread and butter grant focused on the intersection of sex and gender influences in health and disease. So those applications must account for both. Another step that we've taken is to develop a variety of online educational tools to provide information to investigators, to students, to seniors, folks in, uh, at all levels about how to account for SABV and the importance of sex and gender. Our bench to bedside integrating sex and gender to improve human health is a collaboration with the Office of Women's Health at the Food and Drug Administration. And we have six modules highlighted here. And each of the modules goes through how sex and gender affect health and they're designed for professionals, health ed education and any of the health professions, excuse me. Our SABV Primer is our newest edition. And this is a four module course that highlights the SABV policy and describes how to account for it, how to integrate it into your work from designing the study to reporting the study and it's designed for researchers. And most recently we added in an introductory course that includes a facilitator guide. So why is this important? Here's another example of what I like to call SABV in action. And this work was funded as one of our specialized centers of research excellence. And Dr. Susan Chang from Cedars sinai recently published a paper where she looked at across four different cohort studies with 54% of the participants being women, what a normal blood pressure was. When you go to the doctor, somebody will take your blood pressure and they will give you a number. There's a high number and a low number. And typically what you hear as normal is 120, systolic blood pressure over 80, diastolic blood pressure. And anything above 120 and clearly above 140, which is a diagnostic cutoff for hypertension or high blood pressure is considered abnormal. But based on the fact that they looked at what was normal, they found that the normal systolic blood pressure for women was 110, 110 millimeters of mercury, as opposed to the 120. And now if you can imagine if guidelines for treatment of high blood pressure are based on 120 being the normal, and in this case, 110 is actually the, the area where women continue to develop um, consequences, we are not diagnosing some women that have elevated blood pressure blood pressure. So we're underdiagnosing women because we didn't account for sex differences in this vital sign and we are not diagnosing their hypertension. And so Dr. Chang recommends that clinicians revisit hypertension treatment guidelines that don't count for sex differences. And I think that revisit and rethink is a big part of what SABB does. Liter literally the word research means think again or look again. And we need to rethink a lot of what we know. So accounting for sex as a biological variable is not just about looking, at, looking for sex differences. Sex being female or being male has profound impacts on health. And clearly one of the spe sex specific uh, conditions that only women experience is pregnancy. And I really do wanna include a brief mention of the IMPROVE initiative, which is NIH's initiative implementing a maternal health and pregnancy outcome vision for everyone. It's an NIH-wide program, and I'm privileged to co-chair that along with the director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and the NIH Associate Deputy Director. And we're looking at gaining evidence about the causes of maternal mortality and morbidity because the United States is, has the highest maternal mortality rate of high in country, come countries in the world. And there are, these rates are higher for African-American women. So last year we funded 36 projects, over $7 million. And we focused on several areas, mental health, 
And there's one example, remote supervision for implementing collaborative care for perinatal depression and important postpartum um, morbidity. Uh, and one looking at prenatal blood pressure patterns to predict pregnancy related hypertension in later life cardiovascular disease risk, because we now know an average three years after preeclampsia or pregnancy induced hypertension is, is uh, noted, there's a risk for hypertension developing within three years of that pregnancy. Immunity and the role of host microbial interactions in altering preterm birth risk among Black women. And I'm also excited to share with you our newest funding opportunity announcement related to improve as a small business initiatives for innovative diagnostic technology for improving outcomes for maternal health. Here we're looking at tools that might be able to identify women at high risk, predict those women who are at most risk for having a poor outcome, support multi-level interventions that address racial disparities, clinical decision-making that considers social and cultural biases, wearables, point of care, portables or clinical devices are all the kinds of applications that could come in through this SBIR funding opportunity announcement. You heard from Dr. McCarthy a little bit about COVID and you heard from um, Dr. Schubert at the very beginning about sex differences there. The top left, um, his bar graph shows the fact that men and women are about equal in terms of being infected with COVID in terms of cases, confirmed cases and hospitalizations in this global data. This is international global data in that top left. But if you look at ICU admissions and deaths, we see a higher fatality rate for men than in women consistently across the board and across all ages. As you can see in the bottom there, which is the death rate in the United States with the blue bars representing men and the purple bars representing women. And what about the publications and how we're studying COVID-19? Um, this e-clinical medicine paper published by the Lancet highlighted the sex gap in COVID-19 trials. Among 30 st studies that were testing pharmacological treatment of COVID-19, none of them stratified their subjects by sex in their study design. One stratified data by sex in an after the fact analysis. None of them investigated the effect size by sex and a quarter of them enrolled twice as many men as women. So clearly in terms of how we are reporting, analyzing and designing our studies, in COVID-19, we do have work to do there. I am pleased that there are journals and scientific associations and societies like the Endocrine Society, like the Society for Women's Health Research, who have been talking about the importance of this issue. And the Sex and Gender Equity and Research or SAGER guidelines have been published several years ago and provide a map for individuals to understand how to do this. So there are guidelines that are out there. As I wrap up, I do wanna make sure that you're aware uh, of our upcoming fifth annual Vivian Penn Symposium. And we are looking at integrating sex and gender into the biomedical research continuum as a path for better science and innovation this year. It's May 11th and 12th, and our, our, we're designed here to build bridges across sectors. Uh, to develop strategies to integrate sex and gender considerations across the research enterprise and to apply a multi-dimensional perspective and transdisciplinary approaches and, and partnerships to foster them. So if you'd like to learn more about this, you can connect with ORWH. Our 30th anniversary issues are available of our In Focus quarterly publication. You can subscribe to that and subscribe to our monthly email update called The Pulse and follow us on social media. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. So folks, keep the questions coming. I see them coming in, we'll get to them. Um, and I would also say that we will be sure to share all of the information um, that Dr. Clayton just mentioned as well in terms of upcoming events, but also that SABV primer. Um, and with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Becker to discuss the progress that we've made in learning how to better consider sex and gender in research and highlight areas where maybe we still need some improvement. Dr. Becker. I'm honored to be here to talk about um, where we've come since the 2016 sex as a biological variable in terms of our current successes and the, the future uh, needs that we need uh, to address in this venue. So 
why should you care about sex as a biological variable? I think Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Clayton both gave you uh, a lo lot of ideas about why it's important. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, infectious diseases and that COVID-19 uh, and other dis infectious diseases vary by biological sex. And then I'm a neuroscientist, so I'm going to talk more about how biological sex can affect gene expression and its genetic regulation throughout the body, including the brain, and then how neural mechanisms for mental health disorders and pain can vary by biological sex, and some of the really uh, important implications that has for the opioid epidemic and treatments of depression. So as you've heard, COVID-19 uh, does vary by sex, and it's in terms of the specific risk factors and the progression and presentation of the disease. So these are just data from two studies from Biology of Sex Differences, which is um, a journal that specializes in reporting how males and females can differ. And as Dr. Clayton mentioned, while the incidence of uh, COVID-19 is not necessarily different between the sexes. Males uh, experience higher incidence of int uh, intensive care, higher deaths, and greater uh, case fatality. And this is true throughout the world and China, uh, the Europe and China, as well as in the U.S., Mexico, and in South America, where males have higher incidence of deaths per 100,000 than females. So. The pandemic that we're experiencing right now really would benefit from understanding more about sex specific treatments uh, that haven't been studied, as Dr. Creighton, uh, Clayton so clearly demonstrated. Now, it, since 2016, we have been doing a lot, and the uh, GTEx study that Dr. Clayton mentioned, gene tissue expression uh, by sex, found when they looked at 44 different tissues in the, the human body, that about 37% of all genes, over a third of all genes, exhibit sex-biased expression in at least one area of the body. And 58 gene trait associations were driven by um, genetic regulation in only one sex. So that what does that mean? That means that, for example, male pattern balding is driven by a gene in males but not females, while birth rate is driven by two different genes. Now, that's an example of where uh, individuals' genes are affecting a trait. But many, many of our uh, diseases are driven by multiple genes. And so we need to understand much more about how genes relate to one another by sex and hormones, as Dr. McCarthy was talking about, in order to understand uh, how sex differences in gene expression might be important for disease. But we know that if you look at neurological disorders, you have a higher incidence of multiple sclerosis in women than in men, while autism and ADHD are more common in men than women. And in particular, things like anxiety disorder and PTSD are more common in women. And so if you look at depression, depression is a disease that affects women at twice the rate that it does in men. And in this study, which I think it really demonstrates how important it is to look at um, how uh, the disease is affecting both men and women. When they looked at the areas of the brain that are important um, and affected by depression, the orbital frontal cortex, nucleus accumbens, for example, they sound, found that the genes that were being, being affected in depressed women versus depressed men were different, and it was a, all different classes of um, RNAs that were coding for genes. So that just illustrates that the proportion of genes that are differently, differentially expressed in depression varies across brain regions and sexes. So even though depression looks the same in both men and women, male and female depressed brains are using different genes. And I think that's a fundamental uh, issue that we have not really addressed going um, up until this time, up until 2016 when people started looking at both males and females. And so the color coding here corresponds to the areas of the brain over there, over in this human brain. So the orbital frontal cortex, for example, the purple circles are female genes that are affected in females who were depressed. 
and the green circles are male brains, uh, the genes that were affected in males who were depressed. And the overlap here, that's where the same genes are affected in the same way. And so what you see is that in all of the different regions of the brain, from the planning center of the orbital frontal cortex to the motivational center and the nucleus accumbens, the amount of overlap is less than 10%. And so you have large numbers of genetic changes induced by depression that are different in men and women. Now, this study was really cool because they drilled down to find out how the genes, uh, which genes were affected, and then they built animal models in order to see what those genes were doing. And what they found was that uh, there is a female-specific driver of stress resilience that is not functional in female depression. And that gives us help, hope because we have now a clue. We, we have a clue that tells us if we can modify that gene, we can reverse many of the effects of depression in women. So these, this is really exciting in that it allows you to begin to use this information about how the brains are different to begin to find ways to treat men and women differently that will allow both men and women to ultimately have effective treatments for depression. Now, one of the other things that uh, Dr. McCarthy mentioned is that there are sex differences in pain and in chronic pain. This is from a study by Jeff Mogul in 2012. And what he did was look at the number of studies that have reported the incidence of pain in both men and women. And what you see is that their women have an excess, um, more prevalent uh, reporting of migraine, chronic back pain, and musculoskeletal pain compared to men. So the the blue bars going up is uh, women show greater incidence. And these are the bars just represent a number of different studies. So in every study that was examined, except for one, women had higher incidence of chronic pain. And then Dr. Mogul went and looked at uh, what subjects are people who are doing basic research in chronic pain using. And as has been mentioned before, 80% of the subjects uh, that were used for studies of chronic pain were males, even though these syndromes are more prevalent in females. Uh, only a very small number, the purple one, is studies that used both sexes and looked at whether males and females were different. So that was 2012. Maybe things have changed since the SABV um, mandate has been in place. And again, Dr. Mogul went in and he looked at studies published in the journal Pain. So he didn't look across all subjects or all journals. But what you see is that SAB is having an effect. More studies are looking at both males and females and reporting sex differences. Uh, in um, the earlier time, 2015, 80% of the subjects were male. Now it's about 50%, and there are more female-only studies and an increase in the number of studies where both males and females are um, studied and the differences are reported. So SAB is having an effect in terms of the, the basic uh, neuroscience. But that means now that we need to have policy following the science. Not only do women have higher incidence of chronic pain, but they have less of an analgesic response to opioid me medication. And that means women need higher doses of opioid medicines in order to produce the same amount of pain reduction that men would have. And so part of the opioid epidemic cause was because women were getting higher doses of opioids and that led to greater uh, vulnerability to addiction. Yet when the um, Federal Plan for Health Science and Technology uh, Task Force uh, issued their response to the opioid crisis, they did not include sex as a biological variable in any of their recommendations. And the only time they talked about women when they, was when they talked about pregnancy. So if we are going to have an effect on treatments and on um, science, we need to use the science to make sure that the policy uh, follows the science. 
So where do we need to go for here in addition to policy, which I believe uh, Dr. Uh, Becker was, the second Dr. Becker is going to talk about next. As you've seen, there are large data sets being generated when you look at sex by gene by trait analysis. And we need better computational approaches, more sophisticated ways to be looking at these relationships. We need systems levels analysis. All of the tissues uh, that were examined had uh, sex by gene by trait differences. And that means we need to begin un to understand how these different systems are relating to each other and how effects of sex differences in one area of the body affect differences in others. That means we need interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary teams to help interpret the data, and they need to prioritize translational studies that test mechanistic hypotheses, because that's how we get to gender-centered treatments that will improve the health of both men and women in this country. Thank you. So with that, I'll invite Mila Becker, Chief Policy Officer at the Endocrine Society to talk about um, policy recommendations, what can scientists, advocates, and policymakers do to drive this conversation forward? Thank you so much. Um, and it is really an honor to be here um, with this tremendous panel. Um, what we have heard today, right? We've heard that there is a, uh, a Oops, sorry, I got excited. Let me go back. What we heard today is that we um, have a growing book of research that shows that sex um, and gender differences matter across the lifespan. We have also learned that research has come a long way. Um, and, but we do need changes in policy or new policies uh, to more uh, truly understand biological, what impact biological sex has on research outcomes. Um, we have also seen that the COVID-19 pandemic provides a clear example of why we need more sex and gender uh, studies and research and um, my job today is to offer some policy recommendations for how we can overcome barriers uh, to the inclusion of uh, sex and gender in research. So I wanna review what policies are actually in place, what more needs to be considered, and um, because of COVID, what else we need to do to advance women's health, um, women's health research specifically, and more generally improve health research for everybody. So I'm gonna start with the existing policies and on my slide, you will see a list of links that should be helpful um, to you. And the slides will be shared with everyone attending today after the program. So the first um, link I provided was NIH's policy on sex as a biological variable. I include a, a link to the policy itself, as well as the Office of Research on Women's Health um, narrative explanation of the policy. Next, um, I included a link because I thought it would be helpful to congressional staff about NIH's policy and guidelines on the inclusion of women and minorities as subjects in clinical research. Third, um, I included, um, for those of you who are new to the Hill, a link to the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, this uh, piece of legislation uh, was um, passed into law by the 114th Congress in December of 2016. Its goal was to improve research and advance cures. It provided a little bit over $6 billion in funding, mostly for the uh, National, Institutes, National Institutes of Health. And in addition to funding for medical research um, and for uh, looking at rare diseases and the cancer moonshot, it included provisions related to NIH's strategic plan for medical research, including the establishment of a task force 
um, on uh, uh, research specific to pregnant and lactating women, as well as charging the FDA with ways to advance uh, cures um, and looking at uh, the effects on women as well as men. Um, also included in my uh, laundry list of links is a link to the Healthy People uh, 2030 Women's Health Objectives. For those of you who aren't familiar, Healthy People um, is an HHS-wide initiative uh, that looks at health promotion and prevention. It does have a goal related to women's health um, and includes several things uh, related to uh, pregnancy, childbirth, um, how uh, to address uh, diseases that affect women uh, like osteoporosis, um, looking at vaccinations, uh, which is something near and dear to everybody these days, and also looking at tobacco use. Um, and then finally, I included a link to uh, the Biden agenda for women, so you can see what the new administration is uh, thinking about in terms of policies uh, to preserve the health of women, uh, protect the health of women and maintain the health of women. All right, the one overarching policy recommendation I wanna leave you with, and with thanks to Dr. Clayton, who I borrowed this visual from, is that we need very much to integrate sex and gender along with race, ethnicity, and age across the research continuum to drive innovation. Uh, we need to look at SABV from the beginning in preclinical policies as well as in uh, clinical research policies in order to truly advance medical research for all people. So if there's one thing you leave this webinar with. I want you to remember that. However, there are some additional policy uh, recommendations that we have gleaned from today's uh, panel. First, uh, we need more oversight of existing policies. We have made pro progress, but we need to do more. We need to increase se sex specific reporting um, in clinical and preclinical research. Um, while um, inclusion of uh, women in clinical research is advancing, reporting is not, and this needs to change. Um, I think the, the next policy recommendation is about mandating uh, sex disaggregate uh, outcomes analysis. Um, and you heard today why that is important. Um, I think that I'd like to share with you or note that there are ways that we can do this um, in the public sector as well as the private sector. And um, I think that it was Dr. Clayton who acknowledged that um, in journals like the Endocrine Societies, we have policies on this which have change reporting um, in our journal. And we have found just by asking authors the question of what was your research design has inspired them to look at research design much more to be inclusive of males and females. Um, another policy we need to look at and develop more is ensuring um, education on SBV in medical school and research training occurs because how can we ask new scientists to follow these principles if they are not trained and are not um, taught about them? Um, I think we need policies to, to develop partnerships and interagency coordination. We always need more of that. And then speaking on behalf of myself and the Endocrine Society, not specifically this panel, um, I think that we most definitely need policies to invest in adequate, stable, and consistent research funding. And that means for fiscal year 2022, what do we need? We need at least a $3 billion, uh, a $3 billion increase for the National Institutes of Health. Well, this year, uh, we saw a lot of things and we experienced a lot of things. And along with 
the coronavirus pandemic, pandemic, we experienced social unrest. We saw the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. And we saw um, compounding crises impacting health and shining a new light on what was lacking in the US healthcare system. In terms of understanding the roles of sex and gender, this state of compounding crises also uh, illuminated what we do know, uh, what we don't know, and what we need to put in place to respond to uh, coronavirus, um, as well as other um, seriouses, serious illnesses. With COVID, we saw differences in women uh, uh, and men's response um, because of their sex biology is playing. Um, we, um, and several examples of that have been mentioned throughout uh, the panel today. Um, we have seen as of today, uh, 28.6 million cases of COVID in the United States and um, over 513,000 deaths. While much of the world is not providing up-to-date sex disaggregated data, we are seeing that men are more at risk for worse outcomes and death independent of age with COVID, as well as some other differences that were described by the panelists. So, I think that that speaks to what I like to call some COVID inspired policy rec recommendations. And these are the following. Um, we need policies to ensure that pregnant and lactating women are not left out or treated as guinea pigs. Um, as has been described today, often uh, this group of women is excluded from research. And so you get therapies or a vaccine um, and you don't know how it will affect them. Uh, we need to disseminate research on how coronavirus and other diseases affect women and impact babies in utero. And we need to study the long-term consequences. For example, we know that babies um, can be born to mothers who are infected uh, with, uh, with the virus, but can be born without it and without antibodies. But we don't know over the long term if somehow this sets up their system differently um, or they will have long-term health uh, co uh, consequences. We need to design outreach to women to inform healthcare decisions. It's important to remember that the overwhelming majority of people who make decisions for their families, their healthcare decisions, are women. And so we need to think about how do we communicate with women to better educate them about the virus, about prevention, and about vaccines. And then finally, and importantly, and speaking um, on behalf of the Endocrine Society, we need to provide emergency supplemental research funding to restart labs, address workforce needs, as and um, that number should be consistent with what is recommended in the RISE Act. Um, during uh, the pandemic, research has come to a halt in many cases or put on pause. It costs a lot to restart that and to address some of the concerns that have happened during the pandemic about what do you do with the workforce. So with that, I think I'm going to stop so we have time for questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, so also just to reiterate, I, I think that we're gonna start with our q and I'm gonna start with actually w the topic that you ended on Mila, because I think that I wanna start there and then I know we're getting some, some questions coming in as well. Uh, but there is a question surrounding not seeing sex-based analyses reported for COVID treatments being reported. And the question is related to whether and also vaccine outcomes, which you've, you've highlighted as well, right? Pregnant women were not initially included in the trials. We know that um, there's been some work retroactively and, and ongoing clinical trials to address that. But the question is really related to why is this the case? Um, and is this because no one is looking? Is it a reflection of sort of a dealing with science in the time of a pandemic? And I wonder if folks have thoughts sort of on that topic and, and potential ways to move forward or ongoing efforts. And I'd throw that to any one of you who would like to, <laughs> to get the ball rolling on that. Uh, 
Well, I'll make I'll make a comment because Katie, you asked it really carefully, which is, is it a consequence of the pandemic? And I would say no, because even before the pandemic, fewer than a third of phase three clinical trials had any sex specific results reported. And I'm talking now about NIH supported studies. And that analysis was repeated. It's Stacy Geller and her co-authors. And that number in the last 10 years actually went down. So this is something we are not doing well across the board. You know, um, the Endocrine Society is, is, a, is unusual in that the Endocrine Society journals require that. That's part of the instructions to authors. But there are many, many journals. They all have different requirements. And this is just not on their radar screen. Oh, that's great. I think that's a great point. I don't know, Dr. Becker or Dr. McCarthy, if you have additional thoughts on that too. Yeah, I would just agree. It's just the endemic culture. I don't think it's anything specific to do the pandemic. And particularly in the field of immunology, if you kind of frame that around COVID, it's just been, they they have just, they're, they're probably, and I, I'm not calling anybody out, but they're like the worst defenders. I mean, they just don't think about sex as a biological variable at all. I do have some good news though, I wanna add, and that is that the 21st Century Cures Act has language in it that requires applicable phase three clinical trials, those that are studying FDA regulated products that are um, to put their results by sex, gender and race and ethnicity into clinicaltrials.gov. And that went into effect for December, 2017. So the trials that were started after that those results will be put into clinicaltrials.gov. And so um, that is really exciting progress, but it's gonna take time for all those studies to be completed, right? And um, there are studies that are supported by NIH, there are studies that are supported by pharma, there are studies that are supported by other entities. So, and they all are covered by various different rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Also the FDA has an office of women's health and, and so, this can be something also they could be looking at, you know, they should have been demanding that remdesivir be looked at by sex or uh, dexamethasone, et cetera, but maybe they'll do it proactively or uh, prospectively. Katie, I would just like to agree with the, the rest of the responses that you heard of, but I, I think that th this also calls attention to the need for education, right? Um, as, as people enter the field of research, they need to have their minds thinking about this and not playing catch up because in a time of stress, you know, this is one of the things that gets, uh, that falls behind. And if, if people have this integrated from step one, uh, that it's likely to be really a part of uh, our research design and our research thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we need to get out of the old tropes where it's too hard to recruit women that, you know, they don't want to participate in clinical trials. And, and so they're underpowered to even look at whether there are sex differences, even when women are included. So we just have to get out of that mindset, I think. Yeah, no, I think absolutely that makes sense. Sort of thinking through how we build this in from from the beginning, um, both in terms of the research workforce, giving them the tools. So again, I think that's why that SABV primer at ORWH is really critical. How can we help spread the word from, you know, an SWHR and endocrine society perspective? I think endocrine society is doing a fantastic job of, of shining a light on these issues, but really building it into everything that we do. Um, and I think to that point that there is a, a question here, and it is something also that I, I've been wondering, and some of you may be better equipped to be able to answer this than others, just in terms of sort of recommendations that can be made. But we have this policy five years later, we know that it is working. Is there um, sort of what's the next step, right? I know we've talked about uh, several of you have mentioned the potential to either mandate there's a question in the chat box about sort of what is adequate SABV look like. Um, and I think, you know, from that perspective, when I think about it, and I would throw this out there, I don't think it's just an NIH issue, right? I think that NIH is certainly leading the way on this, but what are, what are the opportunities there in other areas as well for what those next steps might look like? Well, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll take our part, but my colleagues, please chime in. Um, we are always looking for ways to examine how well we're doing with integrating SIBV policy and applying it to the NIH business processes. 
We've changed our instructions. We've changed our forms. We've changed our way that we review. We made it very clear what we were looking for. Um, but we fund a lot of research of different types. We have 27 institutes and centers that are funding cl from clinical trials to zebrafish research. And one of the challenges, to be honest with you, with SABV is it can be accounted for in many different ways for different types of study studies, different animal models, different kinds of experiments, whether they're hypothesis generating or hypothesis testing, whether they're clinical trials or observational studies. And so there is no one way to evaluate accounting for SABV. So we've learned that it's not, there is no way to do a very quick analysis to say, okay, you know, this percentage of applications did well. So what we're working on now is a way to be able to at least have the minimum bar, which we account for in, in the um, policy where we say at a minimum, there should be an analysis plan that says that you are going to look at the data by sex, right? And it, this is also affected by what we know about sex differences in a particular area. And I don't know if Peg or Jill wants to comment about this. In some areas, we don't know anything about whether sex matters or not because no papers have been published that disaggregate the data. In other cases, we know for some of the things that Peg and Jill mentioned, there are big sex differences. So shouldn't you be designing a study that includes that perspective and allows you to look at males and females distinctly? So the situation is different based on what we know. Right, in, in the, the chat, there's a question about the ADHD and autism diseases, which are primarily male and how th that might be um, addressed by looking at the symptoms. But part of the issue has been when we look at autism or ADHD in animal models or clinical studies, because they're primarily in males, we look only at males. And so we don't actually look at what the phenotype looks like in, in females, uh, especially young girls, and we don't know whether the genetic traits that are being uh, expressed in males are different from the genetic traits that are being expressed in females. They could be having very similar disorders that look the same like depression, but are being mediated by different genes in, in males and females. We know that some individual genes can produce autism in both sexes, but um, you, we don't know that that's the case in all of autism. And so we need to be doing much deeper analysis of um, these types of things. And I think we need a sex and gender moonshot. The cancer moonshot did a fabulous thing of looking at genetics and cancer phenotypes. but. And Janine has done an amazing amount of work at the Office for Research on Women's Health with no extra money to speak of other than some very specialized funds. We, we need to be emphasizing this as a major priority. And just to be clear, these are our recommendations of panelists, not recommendations that are coming from the agency. But I totally agree with you, Dr. Becker. It's, and I swear we didn't talk about this beforehand, but I, you know, I have been sort of talking about this idea that we really do need a comprehensive, um, you know, women's health initiative. And I think that includes the sex and gender piece of this. Um, and I have, you know, we're coming up on our time. There is something I want to get to and then give you all sort of the opportunity to give your final sort of parting thoughts um, to our group. But there have been several questions about this intersection of gender identity and, and what that means for the study of sex differences. And I wonder if um, folks could speak to that and sort of the approach to this topic, if you have thoughts on that. The questions about gender identity being incorporated. So, well, so from our perspective, and even in the original SABV policy, where we say that it applies to vertebrate animals and humans, there's a link within the policy to a PDF document that gives a little bit more details. And that's where we even say five years ago, we said for people, they're characterized by sex and gender, meaning gender identity and there are a variety of other domains in, in the, the gender construct. So gender, when it's important for the research question, absolutely, it's something that should be incorporated. Um, I would say it's five years, we've seen progress, I'd like to see more, you know, in the preclinical space, there's really a big need for more progress. 
there weren't agreed upon instruments for ascertaining gender identity. There were multiple instruments. But actually, in the last two weeks, uh, Londa Schievinger published a new paper with a gender assessment instrument. So now that there's a tool that's been validated, that's widely regarded as useful, there are a variety of other tools as well. That's something that can be incorporated. So I think that's the next level for clinical studies. I would like to see us do a good job with sex, you know, uh, but gender is, is very important as well. Right. No, and, and that's, and Katie, that's why our R01 has sex and gender. You have to address both in that, in that particular R01. Absolutely. Okay, so I can see we have one minute and I know I'm gonna run a few minutes over. Uh, we appreciate everyone hanging in there with us. I know we did not get to all of your questions. Again, we will send you what we have um, and you know continue to reach out as necessary, but there will be more to come, I promise on this. Um, I'd ask each of you to just provide your super brief parting thoughts. What's one thing you would want to just leave with um, our participants today? And maybe we'll go the same order we went uh, for our talk. So Dr. McCarthy, Clayton, Becker, and, and Becker too. <laughs> uh, well, I'll just end with a, just sort of a personal note of optimism in that it is amazing. It's only been five years and I've already seen so much change and it takes cultural change right and that's what it's really going to take you know is what is the next step is cultural change and it really i mean uh, the the movement amongst my particularly my male colleagues it's been slow but steady and sure and they are really coming around and that's the best way they don't feel it being jammed down their throats they're coming to it on their own it's like oh yeah this is good science and this is biologically interesting and important and i and i think it's happening so I would add that we want to see study both sexes. We want to see looking at males and females, not just comparing, but looking at treatment effects in males, treatment effects in females, so that we can understand female biology and male biology. And this is a more rigorous way of doing our research. What we've seen from projects like GTEx and others is that when we account for sex as a biological variable as an aspect of rigor, we develop a more complete knowledge base. It's more reproducible. And the bottom line is we actually garner more insights. We learn more. And so there's some incredible insights that have been garnered through looking at sex as a biological variable. And I'm excited about the future where we can take this to the next level. Yes, so I have uh, two comments. One is that you know, I teach undergrads and when I tell undergraduates that uh, people don't study female uh, animals, they are totally shocked that you know the, the basic biology isn't being done in, in both sexes. And my other comment is I think the science, when people start seeing the differences in the response of the brain and male and female depressed uh, patients, they're they're so surprised that it there's no overlap. I think the differences are going to drive really great science in the future. So the more we do both sexes, the more we find that's really cool. So wrapping up, I would just say that this issue is one of the most important health issues that we have, and um, the NIH SAB policy is extraordinarily important um, it, and we need to advance it. And in order to be successful, we also need um, a financial commitment and investment for NIH so that more can be done and we all do. Right. Well, thank you all. And, and before we close, I do want to let you all know, um, back tomorrow morning, um, morning consult, sorry, Thursday morning, every day of the week, it feels like during COVID, Thursday morning and morning consult, um, SWHR and the Endocrine Society will be publishing an op-ed touching on the topics that we covered today and elaborating a little bit on how we work to address the topic from a policy perspective. Um, in addition, for any researchers watching this, SWHR published a commentary last week in Alzheimer's Prevention Research and Clinical Interventions. Um, calling on Alzheimer's researchers to better integrate sex as a biological variable in their preclinical work and providing examples of best practices for doing so. So continuing to beat this drum of what we need to do and where and make sure that it's incorporated.
Um, and we, again, will make sure to include these links and the um, link to the recorded video, the slides, all of that, when we send it to all of the folks who registered. So please watch your email. Um, and thank you again, especially to our amazing panelists. Uh, we're getting great feedback. You all did a wonderful job and, and really provided some great insight on this particular topic, which is so important. Um, thank you again to the Endocrine Society, Mila, and your team for being so wonderful. And we really enjoy working with you. And also I need to thank um, our supporting organizations, the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences and the Women's First Research Coalition for their support of the briefing. So thank you everyone for your time. Have a great day.